Welcome back for part two of my lecture on integrative modeling of biomolecular complexes in the context of the BioExcel uh, online summer school. So now that you know everything about docking in general and docking with Haddock, we're going to move into application example illustrating how you can use diverse set of data and diverse information to guide the modeling process. And we'll start with the modeling of antibody antigen complexes. As you are probably all aware, the antibody structure cons consists of two chains, a heavy and a light chain, and the action is happening in this uh, head, where you have the, uh, you see here the light chain in magenta and in more grayish color, the heavy chain, and the loop in these regions are the loops that specifically recognize their um, antigen. They are consisting of six loops. So we are, they are called H1 to H3 for the heavy chain loops and L1 to L3 for the light chain loops. H3 is typically the longest and the most difficult to model because of conformational uh, viability. So this is where the binding usually takes place. And this is, of course, information, this is knowledge that we can use to guide the modeling process. So to benchmark actually uh, how well this... Uh, kind of information can guide the modeling process. We used a small data set of 16 complexes that I extracted from the docking benchmark 5. So this is a reference in the field when it comes to docking. This is what you are using to basically measure how well your method is doing in terms of predicting complexes. We decided to test different docking approach here. Uh, this is the work of Francesco, former PhD student in my group. And we use four software uh, which allow uh, first that are simple to use, um, that some of these are available as web portals, but they also have specific options to deal with antibodies. Uh, so ClusPro, ZDoc, these are two uh, rigid body grid-based fast Fourier transformation uh, uh, docking software, and they have options to either uh, define these um, hyperviable loops or mask regions for the search, and LightDoc is, uh, I, I show, is one of the software which is, it's one software which uses actually artificial intelligence swarm-based optimization and also has options to define residue that are important for the interaction and our own, excuse me, our own Haddock software. So those allow you to define restraints either for the scoring, which will be done more in ClusPro and ZDoc, or to drive the modeling process, which is done in Haddock and LightDoc actually. So we tested different scenarios, which represent different types of uh, different levels of information on the system. For the antibody, it's clear we have the hyperviable loops where we know that the binding is taking place. We might not know exactly which amino acid within this loop is uh, actually contacting the antigen, but in general, we have this information. On the antigen side, things are more complicated. It's not always easy to predict where things are binding. So we have actually three different scenarios. In one scenario, we assume that we have no knowledge of the binding site on the antigen, so we are targeting the entire surface. For Haddock, this will mean that we define all solvent accessible surface residues as passive. And then we have a scenario where we say we have some knowledge of the binding site on the epitope, and we, this knowledge is based on the knowledge of the crystal structure, so it's an artificial set but we define all residues that are within 9 angstrom of the antibody as being part of the binding site. So that's a rather well-defined uh, epitope. And then we have, the, the, say, the ground truth, which is all the residues that are making contact at 4.5 angstrom. So this is the perfect scenario. So you have a perfect definition of your binding uh, on the antigen side. So we tested all three scenarios with all four software. How do we measure the quality of, of, of docking models in general in the fields? So these are uh, criteria that are used in, uh, in CAPRI, this critical assessment of predicted information, well accepted in the field. So we have three measures. Uh, the first one is what is called the fraction of native contact. So if you have a reference structure, a crystal structure, often you have a list of contacts that are made across the interface. If you have your docking model, you can calculate how many of the contacts that we find in the reference are present in the model. And this defines this fraction of native contact. So the number of common contact between the two divided by the number of contact in the reference. 
So if you have a fraction of native contact of one, you have predicted all contact correctly. So the other measures the, uh, require superimposing the model with, to the reference, and then we have two measures. In one case, we superimpose on the receptor, the largest of the two molecules, and then we calculate the RMSD difference on the ligand, on the smallest of the two. So that's called the ligand RMSD, L for ligand. The other one, we do the fit of the molecule of the model onto the reference on the interface, and we use for that the interface of both the receptor and the ligand. So this is more focused on the interface. Uh, because it's more focused on the interface, the RMSD values that you are calculating are typically smaller. Here the RMSD values are larger because <coughs> changes which might be remote from the interface might lead to higher RMSD value even if the interface is well defined. So to define a high accuracy prediction, we want to have at least 50% of the contact correct. The ligand RMSD or the interface RMSD should be below one angstrom. We have a medium quality solution, which is attributed two stars in Capri uh, terminology. If you have 30% of the contact correctly predicted, ligand RMSD below five or interface RMSD below two, and you have an acceptable solution if 10% of the contact at least are correctly predicted and the interface RMSD is below 4 or ligand below 10. So this is the metrics that we're going to see in more cases in my examples. And here are already the results of all the docking that we've been doing. So three scenario times four different software. Each row in this plot corresponds to a scenario. So here no information on the antigen. So we have the entire surface of the antigen. Here we have a rather, uh, we have a loose definition of the epitope on the antigen, and here we have the true interface. So this is the perfect case. Each column corresponds to a different software. What do you see on the x-axis of those plots? This is the number of models that have been ranked by the software which you are considering. So what's your success rate, which is the y-axis, if you only take the top one model predicted by the software? and we depict the quality of the models by colors. So dark green is high quality within one angstrom. Um, light green is medium quality within two angstrom interface RMSD and blue is an acceptable model. So if you look at all the plots together, you directly see that actually the haddock column has the most dark green and also has in general uh, the highest value of all. Uh, so, so that's the first uh, observation. So using the information directly in Haddock to drive the modeling process uh, does benefit clearly the generation of models. What you also see is that the more information you input into the system or the better the information is that you have, the better all the software are performing. So here you have the true interface and you see that Plus Pro, ZDoc, they're all doing very well. Actually, all software are doing quite well if you select the top 100 models but not all have the same scoring capabilities. For example, a light dog is doing very well even without information on the antigen. So you see a success rate here that goes to above 60%, 65% success rate in the top 100, but it's not able to identify those models because they are not scoring in the top, say, 10, which is only 6%. Ad hoc will reach about 31% if you have the entire surface, top 10, which is, about, uh, which is actually slightly higher than uh, Clus Pro and ZDoc is reaching about the same level as well. Uh, as soon as we start adding information, then you see that things change. So we see Clus Pro is, uh, so all software benefit from information, but we see that in general, actually, Haddock is one of the best performing and we see that we are generating now high quality model because we use the data directly to drive the modeling, which is not the case in Clus Pro and ZDoc. And if you have the perfect interface, then you have 100% success rate in case of ad hoc, even top one model, uh, while the other software reached out after top 10 or top 50 in the case of ZDoc. So there's a clear benefit in uh, using the information for the modeling process. So these were single structure-based statistics. So now we can look at uh, uh, cluster-based. So if we do clustering and we assess the clusters, and you see here, uh, this is only ad hoc in this case, the three scenarios, entire surface, uh, loose definition of the epitope, perfect definition, and now the x-axis goes only to top five because the clustering limits very much the number of models that you have to look. And you see that after clustering, if you have good data, you reach 100% success rates. This was already the case in single model. Um, in uh, 
with a loose definition of the interface, we are above 50% with clustering. If you look at top one, and if you look at single structure clustering, we are below 50%. So clustering does help also in the scoring. But if you look at uh, here, single model, no information on the epitope, we have 25% if we look at single structure. And we are below that if you look at cluster based, because there the, might be more difficulty to cluster structure where you have very few, very little information. So the message here is if you have no information at all, it's better probably to do a scoring on a single structure base for ad hoc. If you have information, then clustering really is the way to go. So if you want to read all the details about the story and many more things, you shall refer you to this uh, structure article that was published last year. So using information, and in this case for the antibody, it's the knowledge of the hyperviable loop with some knowledge of the epitope. If you have it clearly improve the modeling of antibody antigen complexes. So let's move now to another application example, which in this case is modeling from mass spectrometry data. And this is the work of Adrien Melchior, former postdoc in my group. And we're going to look at an assembly, a complex, which has to do with the bacteri uh, bacterial circadian clock. A circadian clock is the reason why we have jet lag if you move, say, from Europe to the US. So we have an internal clock that uh, kind of measures day and night. And bacteria also have, some bacteria also have such a system. And uh, we are here looking at the cyanobacteria, which actually uses light uh, as an energy source. And uh, it has a very fascinating system. So you only need free protein in this bacteria to generate this molecular clock. So you can overexpress those free protein called K, A, B, and C. You add phosphate and ATP, and the clock starts ticking. That's all you need. How do you know the clock is ticking? You can monitor. There is a phosphorylation, dephosphorylation process taking place during, between these proteins. And you can monitor the phosphorylation, phosphorylation state of the system by mass spectrometry. And then you can really follow the, the frequency of your clock. Now, MS in this case uh, gave us some information. Uh, for now, we are only going to focus on the complex form by KB and KC. So from native mass spectrometry, where we're looking at a full complex, we know that the stoichiometry of the complex should be 6 to 1. So 6 KB molecule binding to 1 KC. And doing hydrogen deuterium exchange experiments with MS, detected by MS, the binding interfaces of those proteins have been uh, identified. So you see here KB, which is the smaller of the two proteins, and the blue regions are protected from HD exchange when the complex is formed. And this defines one surface of your protein. We also have some mutagenesis data, those three amino acids here, arginine and uh, lysine, so positively charged amino acids, if mutated, abolish or alter the binding properties. Here you see Kc, which is the larger of the two components, so you see it's, it's a much larger system. It's kind of a double donut. And what you see in blue are again here the uh, HD exchange uh, data identified by MS. So those regions are protected from exchange when the complex is formed. And you see that there is a six-fold symmetry. So on the top you identify six binding sites and at the bottom we also identify six binding sites. So this will be 12 in total, but we know that the binding is 6 to 1. And we also know uh, that the binding should happen either on top or the bottom, but they should not be a mixture. What is also interesting is that if you open the donuts, you see that there are also protection uh, differences at the interface between those two. So there seems to be a communication between the top and bottom region of the system. So what did we do? Since we have two binding sites, we did two docking experiments. Once targeting this one, so we didn't dock 6 to 1, but we docked 1 KB onto KC and we only docked onto this region. And we did the same for the bottom. So the top region is called the C2 region, and the bottom region is called the C1 region. And this is the outcome of the docking, basically. So we get two sets of solutions. Based on the Haddock score, we could not say if the top solution, C2, were better than the bottom solution, C1. Forget about this for the time being. And these are the different clusters that we obtained. So we have two sets of solutions, and based on our scoring function, we are not really able to distinguish uh, those two. But MS comes to the rescue, and in this case, it's ion mobility mass spectrometry. So in mass spectrometry, you can have a molecule moving in a spectrometer, so the native complex moving in a spectrometer, 
and you're measuring the time it takes to this molecule to bridge a fixed distance in a spectrometer. It's flying against a gas flow of, um, of ions. And the hydrodynamic properties of the molecule will define the time intake. It's as if you are swimming in a swimming pool. If you put a sombrero hat and go swimming, you're going to swim much smaller, much slower than if you have a, a no hat. Okay, so this has to do with your hydrodynamic properties. So by measuring this time of flight, basically, you can get information about the 3D shape of the protein. So that's a long extrapolation, but it's an experiment which is quite easy to do. This has been done to study the maturation of viruses, for example, but it's also telling you about the arrangement of a, of a protein. If you want to read everything about it, I refer you to this Nature Protocol paper 2008. So those data were measured for this KBKC complex. And this brings us now to this value that you see here below those complexes. So those values are the value that we predict based on the model. So we can back calculate what this collision cross section is, and it's a surface area. You see the units are nanometers to the square. And we can compare those predictions to the experimental values. And the experimental values are indicated by the dotted line here. So the experiment tells us that those values should be between 133 and 140 square nanometers. And if you see the different solution, you directly see actually that this indicates that the C2 solution should be fitting the data better and the C1 solution is actually has two large surface areas for the experimental data. So based on this, we predicted our best scoring model of the C2 uh, interface as being representative of, the, of this complex. And this was published in 2014 in PNAS. Now in 2017, our collaborators managed to actually get a cryo-M structure of this complex. And what the cryo-M model reveals is that C1 is the right structure. So we screwed up, and this happens. You know, in research, it's going to happen to you for sure. At least once, it's part of, uh, of research. So we should not uh, hide these kind of failures, but we should try to learn for those failures. And there are different reasons here why uh, things went wrong. Uh, one possible reason is that we are dealing with non-globular system. If you look at KC, you see this protein as a hole in the center. So it could well be in, in the spectrometer when you do MS, those proteins are flying in vacuum. So if you have something which is non-globular, it could well be that the system compacts in the vacuum of the spectrometer. And if this happens, what you're going to measure is an underestimate of what you have in solution. And this will basically... So if this is an underestimate of what you have in solution, you have to move up those two dotted lines and then the green one becomes the more uh, the better fitting one. So that could be one explanation. But there is another explanation here. And this explanation is that nature is also fooling us. When we did the modeling in 2014, we used a crystal structure, which was a per perfectly fine crystal structure of KB. When the cryo-EM complex was published, there were actually two articles back-to-back -back published in Science, and one of those was describing a crystal structure of KB, but that structure was different. The fold was different, and that's the, this different fold is also what is found in the cryo-EM structure. So it's exactly the same sequence, the same construct, but if you compare those two crystal structures, so the, the one that we used when we did our initial modeling was this ground state fold, this GS fold, and you see it's beta, alpha, beta, beta, alpha, alpha, beta. The same sequence later on was crystallized in a different fold. The first part is the same, but the second part is completely switched. So you go from alpha, beta, beta, alpha, while it was beta, alpha, alpha, beta before. Same sequence, two different folds. So this is not something that you can really predict. We had a crystal structure. We trust that crystallography is generating good models, and there was nothing wrong with that structure. But this is one of those rare examples where uh, a sequence can exist in different folds. So now if we take the correct fold of that protein and we repeat the docking, and in between we also had improved our modeling capabilities in Haddock uh, by introducing coarse graining, meaning that we are going to simplify the representation of the system, so we group four atoms, four heavy atoms into one particle, so we have less particles to deal with, so it's a smoothening also of the 
energy landscape on, of the surface. And for this, we use the Martini force field from Sievert Jan Smaring group. We do the docking at this coarse grain level. And at the end, we transform back the system into a fully atomistic description. And we have support for both protein and nucleic acids, and this was uh, described in those two publications. So we use this approach, and now we went to model the full complex. So 6 KB binding to KC, so it's a seven molecule docking experiment that we are doing. Uh, we use the same data that we used in 2014. We apply C6 symmetry because we have this symmetry in a, in a complex and seven, docking, seven body docking using the coarse grain implementation in Haddock. And what you see here are the docking models superimposed onto the crystal structure. Uh, so it's not perfect, but you see that there is actually quite a nice similarity between the crystal, the, not, not the crystal, the cryo -EM structure, which was about 4.5 angstrom. If you look at the center of mass of the crystal, of the KB molecule in the, in the model, it's very close to the center of mass in the crystal. What is even more interesting is that now the correct solution, which is the bottom solution, scores much better than previously. So previously, we could not distinguish between those two. And in addition, by doing coarse graining, we have a seven-fold speed up in, in the docking process. We did not use the cryo -EM density for guiding the modeling process, but we did use it to validate our model. Now, if we fit our model to the cryo -EM density and we use camera to do that, the correlation score of the model was 0.82. The correlation score of the structure deposited in the PDB for, is uh, 0.84. So the model is slightly lower than the, what has been experimentally determined, but we did not use uh, the data in the modeling process. So that's a nice example of uh, or using first the right structure, the right fold, but this is not something that you can really foresee, and using an improved methodology, uh, coarse graining that allows us to model the full assembly uh, leads to the correct solution. So that was for us a lesson. Since I was mentioning cryo-EM, it, now it's a good way to move into the cryo-EM topic. So cryo-EM and cryo-electron microscopy and cryo-electron tomography now are really the new stars in structural biology. Uh, so you're probably all aware of, of, of what's happening there. So you are basically vitrifying a sample and then you're making an image uh, with an electron of this sample. And in the recent, uh, in the last years, there has been a huge development in cryo-EM uh, because the, the detectors in particular have been becoming way better. And because of that, well, cryo-EM has moved into higher resolution uh, structural biology. So I think the, the record now is probably 1.6 angstrom resolution. So what you're getting are 3D reconstruction, basically. So you, 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 you have 2D images that you have to uh, interpret, find what the orientation is that you are looking at, and then you are reconstructing a 3D object. If the resolution is high enough, then you can directly fit uh, your proteins and your build your amino acids even in, in the density as you were to do for crystallography. But there are still cases where the resolution might not always be um, sufficient. And in those cases, you will have to rely on some other modeling tricks. So, so this was the resolution typically before 2013. We were speaking of blobology, uh, where you will have maybe 10 angstrom, 8 angstrom resolutions, or even 30 angstrom, where you can see the shape of your molecules, shape of your complexes, but you cannot really distinguish which amino acids go where. And these days, we have full atomistic picture. So that's, uh, that's really an impressive uh, uh, improvement. And for that, they also received, the technique received the Nobel Prize. Now, if you don't reach uh, high resolution enough to build the model, and this is what has been happening for many years, you need to, so what has been done is to use existing structural information, so crystal structure of component of a complex, and then try to fit those into the density to generate a 3D model of your complexes. And this is still happening because not all cryo-EM maps reach a resolution which is sufficient to build from scratch. Also, you should know that resolution in cryo-EM is not a constant. Resolution depends on uh, where you are in the map. So some region of the map may be very high resolution and some other regions might be low resolution. So you might, need to, you might be able to build from scratch structure in part of your maps and you will have to rely more on modeling for other parts of the map. Now, how this fitting was done or is typically done is to do that one molecule at a time. 
So you take one molecule of your complex, you search a bit like we do in grid docking, you search all translation and rotation and you measure the correlation to the electron density in that case, and you find the locations where those molecules fit. But you do that one component at a time, meaning that you never take into account the interactions between the components typically during the fitting process. Uh, so you don't take energetics into account and flexibility is usually added afterwards. So we want to see if we could actually use Haddock, which used the energetics during the docking process, to improve those cryo-EM models, um, to generate better, more reasonable uh, views of those interfaces. And this is the work of uh, Rido van Zundert, who implemented basically EM restraints into Haddock. So the way we do that, uh, so Haddock uses uh, CNS. CNS is a crystallography and NMR system. It's a software used in NMR and in crystallography to calculate structure of molecules. It has a lot of uh, restraining functions. So the distance, this ambiguous restraint that we are using in Haddock are actually applied in CNS. CNS is also a way of describing density because it's used for crystallography. So you can transform an electron uh, density into a crystallographic uh, representation and then we could use the energy functions that are in CNS to optimize against this density. Now if you try to dock directly against the density the system is not converging so there's a bad convergence um, and it's not uh, working. So our way of solving this issue is to first identify in the density the most likely location of the molecule and we place centroids at the center of masses of those. And there are ways of doing that I'm going to come back. So once we know where the molecule should end up, you might not know which molecule end up where, we define a distant restraint from the center of mass of each molecule to those centroids. And we used distance restraints again into Agarc to bring the molecule together, together with electrostatic van der Waals interactions. So this is basically generating an initial model of the complex once this, mod, this uh, complex has been generated, we turn on the energy term that represents the density and we're going to optimize against this density. And these optimized solutions are going into the flexible stages of ad hoc where we also have these energy um, functions active. So we can now incorporate EM data into the molding process into ad hoc and combine this information with any other type of data that we might have to drive the molding process. Now, how do we get those centroids? Uh, since we, they, they were ways of doing that, but we wrote our own fitting software, which is called PowerFit. And PowerFit gives you, next to the location of the molecule, it outputs also the coordinate of the centroids, the most likely location of the center of mass of the molecule. And this is the input that you can then fit into ad hoc. So here is one application example. So we're looking now at the 16S ribosome and we're looking at a protein called KSGA binding to that ribosome. There is an EM map available. This is the resolution, 13.5 angstrom. We have the crystal structure of the ribosome, the 16S ribosome. We have the crystal structure of KSGA. On the RNA side, there are data from hydroxy radical footprinting that are telling you where the protein is binding. So basically the RNA is protected from these hydroxy radicals because of the presence of the protein. So this is pointing to the binding site on the uh, ribosome site. And on the protein side, we have also mutagenesis data. So there are three residues that have been mutated and shown to prevent the interaction, prevent the binding basically. So this is all the information that we have to do this modeling process. Of course, there is a structure uh, model of this uh, structure, uh, of this uh, complex that has been uh, deposited, this 4 ADV. It looks beautiful as long as you only look at the backbone representation, but when you turn on the side chains and you look at the interfaces, you see a lot of clashes. And the reason for those clashes is because the fitting was done in a rigid body fashion. So everything yellow here are clashes. Um, if you look at the three mutations that are important for the, for the interactions, uh, one of them uh, connects to the RNA, but it clashes actually, and the other two are not even contacting. Actually, only this one makes a reasonable contact, this one clashes, and this one is not even contacting. So the, the model that was built based on the EM data does not really explain the data that we have on this system. So can we do better? 
that's the question. So can we use Haddock to generate a model which will not have all these clashes, all these bumps? And here is the result of this modeling. So you see here now the RMSD with respect to the deposited structure in a PDB versus Haddock score. This score now contains the correlation between the model and the electron density. You see that we are getting basically one set, a unique set of solution, and this is the solution that we are getting. And now you can zoom in in this interface and look at, for example, at those three amino acids that were mutated, and they're all making nice interactions. It doesn't per se mean that they are correct, but at least they explain the reason why, if mutated, those, mut those residues are preventing the binding. And what is also interesting is that the model now reveals additional key residues. There are two arginines that we identified from the model that seems to play an important role in the binding as well. Those two, these were the other one. So this gives you additional handle to test the model. So we could do mutagenesis on this and test if indeed this is changing the binding. And all those amino acids that, we, that were previously mutated, but also the one that we identify are also actually quite highly conserved. So you see a map of conservation on the surface, on the backbone of the protein. So this is all consistent. So we have now a way of supporting cryo-electron microscopy data in Haddock. It's available also from the web portal. Uh, and it can be combined with any other type of uh, data that we have uh, with Haddock. So now, last part of, uh, of my story, we're going to move into membranes and membrane complexes in particular. So about 20% of the proteome is con consists of membrane proteins. And if you look at the statistics, um, so uh, you see that uh, the, the number of, uh, say, the number of proteins, unique proteins, and the number of uh, membrane proteins is, uh, is very different. So this is statistic from the PDB. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, structure in the PDB that are, say, soluble proteins, but there is a small amount of uh, membrane protein. This, is, uh, this has been increasing in recent years because this is not going all the way to 220. So the situation is becoming better. But a lot of the new structures are all of the same type. These are GPCRs a lot. But uh, those membrane proteins are very important because about 50% of the drug targets are against membrane protein. And they have their challenges uh, to study uh, experimentally. Uh, difficult to study by NMR, by crystallography. Uh, Cryo-EM, you start seeing models of so, membrane proteins, but the resolution in the membrane might be uh, sometimes problematic. So you also need methods to, to be able to model the complexes that are formed in a membrane. So if you think of what's happening in a membrane, the, the environment is different. So, so inside the membrane, we have a very uh, hydrophobic environment. In water, in the, for the soluble protein, we have, of course, a water environment. And when a complex forms in water, typically what you observe is that the region, the interface regions are quite hydrophobic. So you want to bury hydrophobic regions when you are in solution. In the membrane, this is not going to give you a, much discrimination. So in the membrane, the membrane will, have, will impose some kind of different energetics to the recognition process. And further, the membrane also imposes restrictions because you know that the protein cannot, say, uh, rotate 90%, 90 degrees to be inside the membrane. So there are regions of the protein that want to be in the membrane and there are regions that want to be outside the membrane. So this is topological information which, in principle, we could use. And pretty much most docking approaches that have been developed until recently were only targeted and optimized for soluble proteins. There are some examples of... of uh, uh, there is some work from different groups on, on using membrane uh, potentials. So first thing we did was to define a benchmark, identify complexes. It's a small benchmark, about 35 entries, but unique proteins, uh, so no overlap between those entries. Um, and we have tested Haddock without any, just in a standard protocol, basically, without any membrane-specific tricks. And the data set is available from uh, SPGrid. Uh, the data repository of SPGrid, so if you are into scoring function optimization, you could download those and try to optimize uh, things. So if you have data to guide the modeling, Haddock is doing already quite well. And in the iron piracy example I showed you at the end of my first part, uh, you see that you are getting, uh, you, you can do very reasonable docking using the knowledge of which loops are in the in solution. Still, we wanted to, to explore more this field. And one question that uh, we wanted is, can we actually 
explicitly account for the presence of the membrane in the docking process. And for that, we combined two docking approach. Uh, I only uh, a light dock, which is, uh, I already mentioned it, which is a swarm uh, intelligence based uh, docking uh, approach with Haddock. And this is the work of Horge and Brian. And Brian and Horge developed previously a light dock before joining my group, and now we have been integrating the two. So, light dock. Uh, it's based on a glowworm swarm optimization algorithm and glowworms, basically you have this energy landscape here and glowworms attract each other depending on the, the amount of light they emit. For docking purposes, light is uh, transformed into some kind of scoring or energy function and uh, glowworms, they are not, um, uh, they, they usually uh, come in pack in a swarm. So what you have is that you have a lot of different glowworms. You see here two swarms. So this is one swarm, this is the other swarm. And the glowworms will tend to move in a direction attracted by the other glowworms that have lower energy. So this guy here is going to move in the direction of this guy because this one has a lower energy than this guy. It's also similar to what you see, uh, you know, flocks of birds uh, flying, they, 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 they follow very closely each other. The same is going to happen here, but in a complex energy landscape. We use that to sample this energy landscape. Now, LIDOC also has the ability of defining specific residues important for the interaction. So LIDOC was used in this work. So how this does protocol for membrane docking works? So we take, um, so since we are using crystal stru uh, structure from the PDB, uh, there is a database called MemProbMD where they have been doing, embedding those membrane proteins into a lipid bilayer using a coarse grain representation and a Martini force field. So you can find the, the website of this database here. So we extract the receptors from this database uh, together with their membrane. And what we keep are only the phosphate groups of the membrane. And these phosphate groups are going to define a boundary for the docking process. Now, if we know that we are targeting the extracellular loops, for example, we are going to position the initial swarms. So this is one swarm around those loops. So each blue point here is a swarm of glowworm, basically. And these glowworms are basically different starting position of the ligand conformation that we're going to dock. And then we run the LIDOC optimization. And the models that come out of this optimization are clustered. And then uh, because LIDOC is more of a rigid body type docking approach, it has a flexibility option as well. Uh, we need to refine those models to remove clashes. And for that, we're going to use HADOC actually. So that's the pipeline. These are all the complex that we tested. So out of the benchmark, these are the complexes that are uh, where a soluble protein is binding to a membrane receptor. And you see here the results uh, of the light dot docking. In gray will be the docking results without accounting explicitly for the presence of the membrane. And explicitly means using those phosphate groups. And you penalize solutions that penetrate this phosphate layer, basically. Once we use this membrane topological information into LIDOC, you see that the results improve dramatically in all cases. So these are the alpha helical complexes, beta barrel, antibodies. And if you took it, this is the, the all complexes together. And again, you have the number of models that you consider. So great improvement by using the topological information of the membrane. Now, those models typically have clashes at the interface. So what we're going to do is to use HADOC and we use the uh, the coarse grain to atomic uh, transformation of uh, ability of Haddock to basically refine the model. So we don't do docking in Haddock, we just use Haddock as a refinement tool. And what you see here is again all the complexes with the left column being the models ranked based on the score and the color coding indicates the number of clashes. So you see the red one have more than 100 clashes at the interface. So all the rigid body, all the LIDOC models have quite a large number of clashes. After HADOC refinement, you see that they are all uh, transforming into majorly green colors, meaning that we have removed the clashes without uh, modifying much the structure of the complex itself. So we have this new protocol that combines LIDOC and HADOC and accounts explicitly for the presence of the membrane. Uh, and we declashed them all at the end with, uh, with HADOC. So this was actually published uh, in Nature Communication uh, uh, earlier, at the beginning of this year, actually. 
here you have the bioarchive uh, reference, but it's art in nature communication. Now, in terms of perspective, uh, ad hoc, the machinery itself can already handle explicit membrane. So we can do docking with explicit membrane, and this was demonstrated by in different papers. So these are users that have been using the server. We needed to change some parameters to allow for that, but once we had done that, they could do docking. In this work, they are doing a study using NMR data to look at the binding of a protein on the nanodisc. And this is a simple uh, test case that we did of a small molecule docking into a uh, ion channel with explicit presence of the membrane. So we might be moving toward explicit membrane docking in the future. This is something that we are actually uh, uh, benchmarking and developing now. Okay, so that's a work in progress. So now to conclude and give you a little bit of perspective, so I, I hope to have given you an overview first of the docking methodology in general and convince you that using data when you have them, using information to guide the modeling process is really a useful thing to do. You have to realize that when you do this kind of modeling, what you're getting out are models and these are not experimental structure, but the models are very valuable to generate new hypotheses and drive the experimental work. So you can build on the model to validate those. As such, information-driven docking, integrative modeling is very complementary to classical structural methods. So where is the field going? So what you see here is a picture that uh, we created actually to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the protein data bank. And this is an illustration of what I would like to call integrative structural biology of dynamical landscape. So you see this funnel where you have a cryo -M machine, mass spectrometer, NMR machines, you might be doing large scale say, experimental assays. Uh, you combine that with software and together you get a representation of uh, macromolecular assemblies, but we will have to capture not only one model, but many of those assemblies are dynamical. So I think the trick will be in the future to also describe the full landscape of those assemblies. You see here the 50 has different conformation. It's more open here, it's more closed here. So we will not have only a single representation of those structures, but we might have a movie of those. And that's, I think, the challenge that uh, the field is, is moving towards. Now, these kind of models are not usually accepted in the protein database, but the protein is working on, uh, on ways of representing those models. And what you see here is the PDB dev, which is a prototype archiving model for integrative models. So if you are working in a field and you're generating some model, you can deposit those models now. And in the future, this will become integrated into the PDB. With that, I want to close. Uh, I want to thank the people in the group who have been contributing to uh, many uh, things that I've been telling you today. So this is our usual group picture uh, since, uh, uh, since COVID is here. Uh, we have support from different national and uh, European projects. And of course, BioXL is very key to all the software development happening around Haddock. Uh, another picture of uh, former group members and software uh, developers that have been contributing. Some of those you have seen already in, uh, in my slide. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>